I'm Cinder Niemela. Welcome to the Inspired Wisdom Podcast. I believe the most powerful gifts you can give yourself is time to reflect on your talents and experience, and then have the wisdom to act with confidence and grace. This podcast is for entrepreneurs, leaders, and individuals who want to thrive in work and life. Your journey to being connected and inspired by the world around you starts right now. My guest today is Karen Keller. Karen is the author of the Amazon number one bestseller, Influence, What's the Missing Piece? Karen works with clients from startups to Fortune 500 companies in 93 countries and 43 industries. She works with them to increase their influence potential. Karen has invested over 20 years of research and client work, and that led to the creation of the Keller Influence Indicator or the K2. The K2 is a scientifically validated and reliable method for the testing, analysis, and evaluation of a person's influence potential. And this is the only tool in the world that measures an individual's potential for being influential. In this interview, Karen will discuss how personal tragedy led to her researching the topic of influence, and that led to her 20 years of research and ultimately the creation of the Keller Influence Indicator. She will share the seven factors that make up one's ability to be influential. So if you strive to reach peak performance, but find the effort is taking a toll, or you are confident in some situations, but you've received feedback that you come across as less confident in others, you've received feedback that you aren't consistently trustworthy or likable, You find your level of passion and commitment waxes and wanes like the phases of the moon, and you want to understand the relationship between executive presence and influence, and show up in a more consistent and effective way. Karen, welcome to the call. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me, actually. (laughs) Oh, my gosh, I've been so excited about this interview. I got your book, thank you so much, and could hardly put it down. Oh, thank you. Well, that's nice. It's it's funny. I had an editor about every other day I would send her anywhere from 50 to 70 pages. So in three weeks, I wrote the book. I wrote so many pages and she said, well, we're going to cut this out. I said, why? That's really important. She said, Karen, you're going to have a book that's 500 pages long. And so we got book two kind of sitting on the floor. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's great. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Oh yes. And you know, in this topic influence, how did you get here to this place where you've done so much great work, writing a book, writing an indicator, a scorecard? on influence. How did you get to this place? What's your story? Well, that's an interesting question. (laughs) And it's a good question. It's not one I share a lot, but I will. In 1996, I uh, lost everything or actually the flood was in 1997. I lost everything I ever owned in a flood. And back in North Dakota, where I was living, and my daughters and I, and I was a single mom at the time, and, you know, it really shattered my world. You know, when you think about the basics, those were ripped away. The flood was so bad that it covered two-story homes in the downtown district. Oh, my gosh. It was a one in 500-year flood. At the time, uh, President Clinton, he visited the area twice. And, um, and it was pretty devastating. The town that I lived in, it was about 55,000, immediately lost about 20, 25% of its population because there were no jobs. I mean, it was just really shattered the community. And I myself ended up relocating. I had a job, took my kids and started over. My, how did I come to this whole thing about influence? I think that it always had an underlying purpose in my life, but I didn't really name it as influence. What ended up happening is my daughters and I, we relocated to another state. We moved to Indiana and I set up a practice there. Um, My background is in clinical psychology, so I set that up. And as things kind of transitioned for me, I read a book and it was from coach to corporation. And And I found coaching and that was really intriguing to me. And, and, you know, it was just a whole nother perspective on how you can help people, you know, and I still had my clinical practice and things were going well there. 
and I thought, you know, there's, there's something to this. It kept kind of pulling me back and it was influencing me. Just this whole concept and idea. And this was in the nineties, mid nineties. Mm -hmm. um, and so then. <clears throat> was it because then, your, your patients were uh, bringing you this as a topic that they wanted to work on or how is it that well, it was influenced? Well, actually, zooming ahead several years is when I really began to understand that it was all about influence because I developed my coaching practice and as that grew and grew and grew, I found myself doing a lot of coaching and stuff. Then I got to a point where I said, you know, I would like to take a step back and to see and do some self-reflection on what my purpose was um, and what my message was. And I wanted to just take some time off. So I did. And during that time, I became very restless and I thought, oh, okay, I need to be doing something, but I didn't want to go to straight coaching one-on-one -on -one, being in all these different time zones, all times of the week and day and night. And so I decided, well, I wanted to really think about what was it that I was really doing in my practice. I looked at it, I looked at files, I looked at and then revisited conversations, all the countless conversations that I'd had with people. And I said, you know, really what they're after is influence. How do I influence my situation or myself? Or how do I take charge? Or they wanted to have control in their life not to be controlling per se, but to have to take charge, to have that kind of control over my life that I can determine my happiness and, you know, what's important to me. And so I started doing that. I started blogging about influence. I started talking about it. And then I said, you know what? And I'll never forget. It was in the middle of the night. I like to work at night. And about two o'clock in the morning, I said, I got it. I'm going to measure influence quickly I realized you can't measure influence unless I were to follow somebody around and make notes for a year and observations but then I realized that you can measure potential and that got me thinking and so I, I started to look at okay we can always measure potential how would I do that what would I be looking for and I started digging in the research and of course, you know, you have the greats like Dale Carnegie and John Maxwell. It's like it's uh, more superficial, you know, tips and tricks type stuff. But I was looking for the real meat of stuff mm -hmm. and, and what it had to do about influence. And I, I was looking at Robert Cialdini, uh, his work on influence. And I started to read and do and discover a lot of these things, which I had already read and done in, in a way. But from the perspective of a psychologist, this was the perspective of a coach. I started to think about what was missing. And that's why I called my book, Influence, The Missing Piece. What's the missing piece? Because there still was that nagging thing that kept coming back to me something doesn't fit there's something missing something missing and as i started to unpack this and kind of let it unfold i realized that there is a difference between having influence and being influential mm. and so say a little bit more about that well having influence you have to go into a room and when you when you enter a room you have to say or do something to have an impact, to have somebody respond in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that's very much been the traditional teaching or education or experience that people have of influence. It's based on authority. It can be based on your title, your money, your position. I mean, a parent has influence because they're the parent or a clergy person or a teacher or a president or a prime minister or the head of a foundation or a professor, whatever it may be, position. Um, people have influence who have great, you know, loads and tons of money. Um, so there's reasons why people have influence. Um, it's really about uh, other people. It's like, how do I learn what I need to know about other people so I can influence them? Mm -hmm. Whereas being influential is, it's about you. It's about what you bring to the table. It's about how people experience you as you are. And so the having influence is an external event. 
I walk into the room, I have to say or do something to get a response. Whereas being influential is an internal process where when you walk into the room, that's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so that was the difference. And I started, then it occurred to me, I want to measure and, and define the difference between these two dynamics because we've had a hundred percent of of our um, you know our whole society has been built on influence I mean it, it it's what influences societies and cultures and everything like this whereas being influential is uh, can also do that but it has a very different mechanism from which it does that so you think of people people having influence could be Indra Nui, you know, from PepsiCo, um, you think of Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, icons of industry type things, people mm. uh, of money and influence that way. Whereas when you think of being influential, you think of Mother Teresa, or you think of uh, Gandhi or Christ or Nelson Mandela, you think of people like that. It was because of who they were that they were able to basically move mountains in some respect. And so I looked at these two different people, we examined them closely and started doing research and started saying, okay, what is it that makes these two groups of people very different? Or what is it that really constitutes being influential? From the research, I pulled 34 influence traits, we call them. I started looking at it. What is it that these people have in common? Mm -hmm. What is it that they're known for? What has gained them great success whether it's a movement among people or whether it's a message in a spiritual sense, whatever have you, went through the process in our, you know, construction of all this, validating these traits. And what we did through our QSORT system is that we identified seven traits and we call them the seven influence traits that make up a person as being, it would qualify them and measure, once we measure these seven traits, it gives us an idea of their potential to be influential. Mm. To ask a, a really basic question, and that is, why would a business person be concerned with the distinction between having influence and being influential? What's in well, it for them? That's actually a really good question. It's not so basic, but it's really a smart question <laughs> because <laughs> as a business person, if I subscribe only to having influence, having influence needs constant, continuous reinforcement almost mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas being influential requires little, if any, reinforcement and so that's what makes a difference. So you have to constantly, continually work at having influence. I got to get that promotion. I have to have that title. I have to get more money. I have to say and do the right things. I have to persuade this person because of what their interests are. Whereas being influential, you can be confident, you can be passionate, you can be trustworthy, and people will gravitate to you. They're going to listen to what you have to say. They're going to seek out your opinion and your thoughts. They're going to trust you. Mm. And see, being who you are takes very little effort. Mm -hmm. All you just have to do is show up. Mm. And so that's the difference. So when I started thinking about this and how this is used in the workspaces that we all exist in, um, even if you're a solopreneur or if you're the chairman of the board or if you're the, the door person, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that you show up as who you are and you can um, maximize and have in abundance these seven traits. You are a very influential person. And so, and that's how it's worked throughout mm -hmm. history. We have example after example of people who have been very influential. They haven't had money. They haven't had position or title, mm -hmm. but they've been very um, passionate. They, they've exhibited great courage, if you will. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about the assessment. Uh, the K2 is the only tool that measures an individual's potential to be influential Mm -hmm. and it is in 92 countries and 43 industries. You've mentioned the seven influence traits. Why don't you go through those traits and tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. them? Well, I have to say, as of yesterday, we just added another country, Mongolia. 
Oh my gosh, that is amazing. <laughs> so, who would have thought that a farm girl from northern Minnesota would be having a conversation with a woman in Mongolia? And I did yesterday morning. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, That's... it's 12 hours difference in the time zone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, we're up to 93 countries now. So the traits, well, they all came out of this and when we look at these traits, the traits are confidence, commitment, courage, passion, empowering, trustworthiness and likability. Those are the things that when those traits are qualities that when people exhibit them in abundance, all of them, one isn't any more important than the other. Now, I do have a favorite one, and there is one that gives me a little bit of problem sometimes. You know, if you have them all in abundance, they all support and interact with each other. Uh, they're all very important. And when you do that, you're influential in your family, you're influential in your community, and you're also influential at work mm. because you're doing what comes naturally and you're learning how to show up with more confidence, how to show up as being likable. It's very evidence-based and data is a big driver for us as well. We did a lot of the research for months and months. We um, put together the first round of assessment and we had a beta test group of 202 people. We were fortunate enough about 14 to 15 months later to get a retest on the same entire group. We had great validity and great reliability. And that's all in our research report that we, we put out for the public to see what we did, how we did it, and the results that we got. But one of the things, though, that was near and dear to me was that it gave me an opportunity to reach massive amounts of people in order to help them learn to help themselves. People say, well, what do you want to do? I want to help people. My idea isn't that I necessarily want to help people because there's not enough of me to go around, you know, or enough mm -hmm. of you to go around because you're great at helping people as well. I would love to have a billion people have this information in their hands. Mm. That's, that's kind of my mission mm -hmm. because once people understand themselves from this perspective, it's not a personality test. It's not an EQ test, emotional intelligence. It's none of that stuff. But I guess I kind of found a crack in the, the assessment armor, if you will. It's a whole nother dimension of looking at a person. And the other thing that's cool about these traits, every single person has all seven traits in this world, every person on the planet. The only difference is, is how they've nurtured them and how much abundance they have and how they use them. We've seen people that have scored very high in confidence, but they don't show up that way. Hmm. And, and it's been quite an experience and a conversation to hear people that say, wow, I have this score in confidence. I never knew I had that much confidence. And so the next question is, what has stopped you from using it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And oh my goodness, the learning that goes on is amazing. It, it automatically causes a shift for a person because they can't shift back. The person that scores high in confidence isn't going to say, you know what, I don't have any confidence because they've already shifted. They can't shift back. That's the definition of shift. So knowing that, now the question is, what's getting in your way? Mm -hmm. And it moves a person along from staying stuck in my confidence. I just don't have the confidence for that. No, something's getting in the way of your confidence. What is it? And so it really moves along towards, you know, um, how people handle their situations, how they make decisions, um, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, when you talk about these seven traits in abundance, and I'm glad you mentioned confidence because I was going to pick on that one. Uh -huh. um, what does confidence in abundance look like? When you have confidence that you are showing up the way you want to show up, that you're taking a risk, that you're confident in knowing what you know, and you're also confident in knowing what you don't know. Um, you're confident in having a conversation. You're confident in taking a stand. I mean, those are some of the outward behaviors that you can see. But confidence also shows up in um, a reduction in negative thoughts. Mm. It shows up in an absence of limiting beliefs. 
confidence really uh, helps the person internally become more of who they are. You know, confidence helps us accept ourselves. Uh, confidence improves our self-worth, our self-image. And so when all those things are clicking at once, as in abundance of confidence, then we go out into the world. We show up confident in our relationships. You know, somebody had asked a question about relationships, and one of the things that popped into my mind was the whole idea about forgiveness. Every single relationship, there is forgiveness that's happening somewhere, somehow. Well, it takes a lot of confidence, but I would say even more of another trait that we measure, courage. It takes a lot of courage to show mm -hmm. forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the results that come from, like, for example, courage. When there's an abundance of courage, we move past our fears. Because sometimes forgiving someone or yourself, that can be a little scary, because mm -hmm. you're not sure what to do with it or what comes next. Mm -hmm. But it's that courage that helps you move to that point and beyond because there's always better things on that. So, you know, you look at the results that you get, you know, and of course you can always compare it to when I don't have confidence, what happens to me then? Well, I second guess myself. I have a tremendous amount of doubts. It paralyzes me. I don't take action. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that can happen when you're short in it. And so when people, they take the assessment, get the reports, they become so aware. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things I wanted to share with you. And this kind of might help their audience put this into the perspective. It's a three rubric type of thing. The first thing is when you take this assessment and you read through the reports, it creates awareness for the person. It's like, what is going on? What is occurring for me? What's existing in my world? And the reports share that with you. The second piece of this rubric is it builds understanding and meaning. In other words, it answers, why is this happening? Because it puts it now into your context. So I have an awareness of what is going on. And the next step is, this is what it means to me at work. It means this to me in my relationships. I'm watching this play out. And so now I can connect to it. And then the third um, piece of this rubric is it drives application and action, the how. How do I fix this if something needs to be fixed? How do I grow this strength? How do I eliminate a challenge and push through whatever barrier I might be experiencing? And then the end thing is you get results. We have a tremendous amount of people that are doing this individually. They work through this and they're going, I have all the information because it comes from the person. I love the assessment because you talk about in each of these seven areas, your strengths and the mm -hmm. opportunities. <laughs> right. There's all kinds of like, you know, you have strengths and we call them challenges because the word weakness to me doesn't resonate, but I think the word challenge kind of is more incentivizing. It's more, it's more motivating. Well, I have a challenge. Let's see what I need to do to, you know, it's kind of like, let's go on a bear hunt. Well, I see a tree, can't go under it, can't go, you know, over it. And so I think about that. So that's why I kind of put it in that perspective of strengths and challenges because challenges are good for us because that's where we do a lot of learning. I wasn't going to eliminate challenges that we run into because we all have that. Mm -hmm. And so that was an important piece for me to include in it. Yeah. When I took this and I reflected on a lot of the clients that I have and what some of their goals are for the coaching, one is confidence and the other one is executive presence. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how it links to executive presence? Sure. When I define executive presence, it's how I show up, but how I show up based on how I feel about myself. That's the defining difference right there. Mm. So many people say, well, executive presence is you have to do, do, do. Me, I say you have to be, be, be. 
because we're human beings, we have a certain sensitivity to each other, to moods, to presence, just in general, to a uh, sense, you know, I mean, all of our senses are picking up on what we see, what we smell, what we hear, what we experience, what we touch, that type of thing. I mean, you can have two different types of hugs, you know, mm. a hug is not a hug. And so <laughs> can aesthetically, you know, it can be different. I hug, I get a different kind of hug from this person than I do from this person. And it's all based on how I feel during that hug. The defining thing about executive presence is how I feel about myself when I'm with you and how I'm showing up. So for instance, if somebody didn't feel really good about themselves, do you think that you would be able to perceive that or receive that in some way, or there would be a hint, this mm -hmm. person doesn't feel really good about themselves. And so then that affects their executive presence. If, you know, if it's an executive, whereas when a person comes into the room and they're feeling confident, they know they're likable, but they understand why they're likable. It's not because they're a yes person. It's because they're genuinely caring and they, spend time they stay present with the person so there's a lot of things going on that they're aware of and they're comfortable with that they feel good about themselves they're excited for the risks that they get to take not have to take they make those kinds of distinctions and when we make those distinctions between a have to and a get to i think that really affects our persona Mm -hmm. So that also comes up, you know, in executive presence. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yes. Yes, I think so. And I hope it does for the listeners because I, I imagine they also have received that or given that kind of feedback as though, you know, sure. around executive presence that you feel uncomfortable or not comfortable in your shoes or in your skin. Right. I love that passion is mm. one of the traits of being influential Talk a little bit about what passion means for you. Actually, it was the first trait that I wrote about. And I did extensive research, but I did a lot of reading about it. But that was the first workbook. There's a workbook that goes to every trait. That was the first one I tackled in writing our workbooks and material on it. Because, and I'll share this with your audience, I thought it would be the most difficult hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. because it's like, okay, this, it's this mysterious kind of thing. I can't really put my finger on it kind of stuff. You know, and I was going, okay, I'm going to start with the hardest one first and start dissecting that and, and sorting through that. And what does all that mean? And in the process, it started to fairly early on evolve for me that it was very strongly connected to purpose. In the instrument, passion is measured via the purpose that you express, the purpose that you choose to live, the purpose that you might be missing. Mm -hmm. um, it's looking at all those kinds of things because when we have purpose is when we connect. You know, you think about two people that make a connection at work. It's because they have a goal in common. If you're an owner of a company out there or you're a decision maker, if you really want to achieve your goal, you will connect the people's purpose which goes beyond, you're going to achieve a lot more than just the goal. And see, I think that that's sometimes missed because there's a lack of understanding about it and there's maybe a lack of attention paid to it. It's too much fluffy, fluffy. It's kind of like if you dissect a person, you're never going to find an organ that's called mind. But we all have a mind, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel the same way about passion. Every person has passion and it's there. It's when we can tap into it. So passion, it's about my purpose. It's about my message. It's about how I view myself in relationship to something greater than me, whether that's God, whether that's a spiritualness, whether it's a natural something in nature. But when I see myself in relation to that and where's my purpose you know what's important to me and then we go further into not only can you identify it and express it but are you living it and how are you living it is is it can helping you connect um you know is it helping you become influential let's say you go to work and you're sitting at the executive round table and sometimes those tables just quite aren't as round as they need to be, are they? <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> That's a myth. They say it's round, but we all know. Anyway. 
Yeah. And so, so, you know, next time you're at those executive meetings, go around the room and ask yourself who is living their passion as best you can tell. And you might be surprised. And when you find someone that says, yeah, you know, she's really living her passion or he's really living his passion, ask yourself, how do I know that? And so when they start to think about and seeing this other person as a passionate human being, it changes how we relate to them. So in other words, when you let others experience your passion, you're influencing them you're being influential in how they communicate with you, how they lead or follow you, how they work with you as a peer on a team. Mm -hmm. That's very, very powerful. Yes. You know, I'm thinking also about something you said about potential. The assessment itself, the scores are from... Well, I know that it's to a hundred. What yeah, I don't twenty five, twenty five to a hundred. Yeah, that's our range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If a person then scores, let's say they score seventy five on one of mm -hmm. these seven yeah. traits, are you saying the potential then would be between seventy five and a hundred? Yes. And here's one of the things that you know I, I can share with your audience because this is really important to know if any of them choose to explore this further. The score is a number and it's not like what we've all been used to, like 90 to 100 is an A and 80 to 90 is a B and oh my gosh, I got a C or heaven forbid a D below 70. Mm -hmm. It's not that at all. It's simply a number to show you where you are and how much you're leaving on the table or how much you yet have to develop. So for instance, let's say in your company, you, a person that is a high performer scores, and we're just going to say like a K factor, which is um, a total score. And mm -hmm. then there are seven scores, one for each trait. So let's just say, for instance, a K factor score of 75. You could have a person uh, who's a very high performer in the company, and he gets a K factor of 75. You might scratch your head and go, huh, that doesn't make sense. In my world, it makes perfect sense because I have now just identified the sweet spot in your company. When you tell me this guy is a high performer and he has a 75, that tells me he is squeezing every drop out of his existing potential that he's using and he's performing up to here. So my question then to the company is, what if you invested in his influence through these seven traits and raised his score to an 82? What will that do to his performance? Mm -hmm. It'll really make it go because he has a motivating attitude. He's got a great work ethic and he has desire. He has desire to, to be better, to be at his best, to work with the company. And so that is the sweet spot of an organization. Now, mm. you can have somebody who has like a 94. And we have some of those people. It's a little rarer, of course. But let's say you have a 94 who has average performance. And they're going to say, what does this mean? And there's a few reasons for that. The person, number one, is lazy. They don't care. Well, mm then there's a decision to be made. Uh, maybe they're not motivated and they look lazy. I mean, we don't know, we gotta ask. But the important thing is, is that now we're aware. Now we have a direction to go to find out what's going on. The other thing is, we could have a person with a 90, 93 or 94 and they're at medium or average performance, they're not allowed to perform any greater. Mm -hmm. So we ask that question. Now we could also have a person that's at a 94 and their performance is kind of mediocre or not mediocre, but it's average. And I would say, what is stopping you from leveraging and using your seven traits? And then we'll go, I never knew. But the important thing about this is, is that every person has control 
over every single one of these traits. Whereas when you do personality assessments, and I'm a big believer in that, I mean, I've used those for 20 years and I love most of them, not all of them. But when you look at a person's personality, you're doing it so people can understand each other via their personality, but you're not doing it to change their personality. And you shouldn't change their personality any more than you change the pedigree of a dog at the kennel shows because that's what makes them unique and that's what makes them valuable. Mm -hmm. So when we look at personality, this is very different because we're looking at traits everybody has and we can all improve them. And so when you have somebody who has a high K factor score or is very high in the 90s on these traits, and their performance does not match, you can say, how are you not using them? How can you better leverage them or maximize them? And it will be amazing. It's like I asked a gentleman one time, I had a call with somebody, he was a vice president of a major company um, in North America, and he was talking about his report and everything, and his first response was, did you talk to my mother? Only my mother would know these things about me. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and so I had to kind of laugh about that because it was pretty accurate. And, and as we talked about this, he said, you know, I cannot recall any meetings or supervisory stuff or appraisals or anything in my entire career where we talked about anything like these seven traits. Mm -hmm. And see, that's part of the thing. People don't normally talk about them, but we all know what they are since they're like eight or nine years old. Now we're talking about it because we're finding that these are real cornerstone. They're very much building blocks and we can move these blocks around. We can grow them. We can understand them. We can use them, but people haven't been. And so we're discovering resources that companies never knew that they had. That is so interesting because often people will say, well, I want to build up my confidence or I want to be more courageous in meetings and speak, speak up more. But it is all of these together that creates influence. I just love the assessment. What are some of the ways that you work with, with companies and with individuals? Well, um, what we do is we, we have people that can get certified. We call them partners. And there's two levels. People who want to become a K2 partner and they are working one-on-one. -on -one. That's what their business is, their consulting practice or coaching practice. And they really, that's where they want to be. Um, we have another level that is an additional training, but it's called the enterprise partner level. And that is, has a lot of materials and it's very geared toward not only one-on-one, -on -one, but also into organizational work with teams and groups and things like this. So this material is very um, scalable. We've developed it to be very scalable and we can do group coaching, we can do it virtual, it can be in person, we can do um, executive meetings, we can do roundtables, uh, we can do workshops with this because it advances the learning. It's not meant to replace anything that an organization is doing because there's a lot of value in so many things that are out there, you know, different leadership programs, different uh, team development programs, things like this. We have a K2 transformational model and we can help build and create an influential company, not just a company, but one that has great influence via these traits. And this is how they will show up with their competition. This is how a company will show up their collaborating partners or let's say a company has already an existing leadership program this is great supplemental material that can be used at the person's discretion you hit on something that was really important cinder when i was doing this every good psychologist when they go into a bookstore where do they go they go to the self-help section mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all um, I spent yes, lots of absolutely. Years. Yeah. How do I fix myself? Well, what do I need to know? What do I don't know? Oh my gosh, people are talking about this <laughs> acronym and I don't know what it is. I got to find out. So we always run that way. Well, it didn't quite change really when I became a coach. It went to the business self-help section, you know, <laughs> and it was autobiographies and models and how-tos and concepts and everything like this. You know, I got to know Peter Sange really, really well. Yes. <laughs> and I have all these books, all this stuff, great concepts, great material, used so much of it. It really educated me. But the one thing 
it never told me was about me. Mm -hmm. And nor could it. But I always had to kind of insert myself as to what I thought I was into whatever it is I needed to learn mm -hmm. or how I needed to show up. Like as an executor, how do I ex how how do how do I execute the plan? You know, actually, you know, yeah. that's so interesting. And I was it just reminded me that again, you're in all of these different countries, 92, 93 countries. Yeah. Do these traits and how you define them, are there distinctions based on country? Well, that's a good question. Let me say this. It is not dependent on culture, race, gender, education, socioeconomic status, industry, position, whether mm -hmm. you're a, a a programmer or you're a vice president or you're this or that it's not dependent on any of these things and I went to great lengths to assure that it was we had several edits done by different people who are experts in that area the only thing that they had me change was I used some uh, phrases that were common to Americans that other people may not know what it is <laughs> and so they said well you know that's something that's an American you know phraseology and I said oh okay but we did that now, mm -hmm. our research, our database is thousands and thousands of people, and I love to look at aggregate numbers. And our research, we started breaking down, and, and it's a huge, it's a massive project because we have so much data that we have collected. We're starting to look at the, the publishing of what we're finding. And we started with confidence. And what we did was we're, we have so many places that we can segment our research or our data, I should say. And so what we did just to try out our process, we took um, United States people and we broke it up into gender and into age groups. And we took just the confidence trait mm -hmm. and we looked at four groups of age level from 30 to 40, 40, 50, 50, 60 and beyond. And we looked at the average confidence score of men and women in the United States in these different age categories. And what we found was that in um, men, their confidence was um, like an 80.3 or 81.3. 80, and it was very consistent in all four age mm. ranges. Mm -hmm. When we looked at the woman's, uh, the female confidence score, it was 70.2. And wow. then it, went, yeah, it started there, maybe 71.1. By the time it was uh, the late 60s and over, it went up to 84. We are starting to see that age is maybe the outlying variable that may impact where we're seeing the scores. When we look at culture, we do not see that. We really, really wanted to make it as culturally and racial and uh, gender and that as blind as we possibly could. And our data is showing, our results are showing that it is that way. So it's interesting when you think about a person coaching an executive from Japan, let's say, mm -hmm. the only thing that impacts how this would be is if the person doing the coaching is from Japan or the person doing the coaching is from like London because the coach has certain biases mm -hmm. and expectations and that's where some of that difference can come in mm -hmm. but as far as the assessment it's blind across all of that that's so interesting. The researcher in me wants to dive more into this. I think everyone's getting a sense that you have lots of stories. And if mm -hmm. you're not convinced, there <laughs> is a wonderful story in the book, which Karen has such a great sense of humor. The story on page 155, The Impact of Trustworthiness on Communication. <laughs> oh, okay. And I don't know if you remember, but it's the story of a country store owner he oh, saw yeah. his young clerk at the front counter talking to a customer, and the owner was horrified as he heard the young man tell the woman, no, ma'am, we don't have any of that, and looks like we won't for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the store owner runs to the front frantically and blurts out, yes, we have it on order, 
and it'll be here next week. Don't worry about it. So he says that to the woman and the woman leaves and the owner reprimands the young clerk and says, don't you ever tell a customer that again. You have to cover up the fact that we are out of it with the statement that it's on its way, even if you know it's not on order. And yes, sir, <laughs> says the dutiful clerk. <laughs> By the way, what, what did she want? Asked the uh, store owner. Rain, replied the <laughs> clerk. <laughs> <laughs> that is, is that the truth <laughs> oh my god and the whole book is full of these wonderful stories that lead right into direct application of trustworthiness on influence and the things that you can do mm -hmm. and it's just wow. it's wonderful so i highly well, recommend it yeah, that is a, recommend that it. is the funny story you know and and so many of these stories part of the reason I included them was because we get so far removed in the daily have to's must haves should haves and all these things that we we get removed and separated from ourselves. Mm -hmm. and those stories at least for me they remind me what's at the heart of everything that we're doing and yeah and it gives me that type of purpose in there so some of those stories really go wow that's so true i forgot <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> oh my gosh you know i just want to ask you one question what's the mm -hmm. most important advice you have for someone who's listening to this Oh gosh, I would say the most important advice is to to know that every person that's listening that you have the potential to do whatever it is you want. Mm, that is so awesome. And I am going to put in the show notes links to Karen's website, <laughs> links to the book, links to the <laughs> indicator, and I highly recommend you take it. I took it, and it was um, really eye-opening, and I want to dive more into it with Karen. How can the listeners get in touch with you? Oh, absolutely. Um, the website is karen-keller.com. I love talking to people who are interested in this just because it, it, it's fun for me, but I also, there's a selfish reason. I learn from a lot of people that ask me questions and share with me their thoughts about what we've done. And, yeah. and so it's a great learning experience for me too. So thanks for asking that. Oh, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. And thank you so much for being on the call. <laughs> thank you, Cinder. I'm Cinder Niemela, and you've been listening to the Inspired Wisdom Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We hope these conversations illuminate your path to your highest potential. For show notes and links to resources mentioned during today's episode, please go to inspiredwisdom.us. You can also follow Inspired Wisdom on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, design a fulfilling and prosperous life that engages your talents and passions.